Hey everyone, this is Sorless and this is going to be part one in a series of videos which is going to explain the strategies used and the routes taken in a Wind Waker speedrun. The reason I'm doing this game is because it's pretty popular right now among a lot of runners and I feel like it's a really fun game to speedrun. Um, the route taken is a lot more natural than the route taken in pretty much any other Zelda. Which makes me think that a lot more people are going to be maybe interested in learning this than, for instance, Ocarina of Time. Which is, you know, full of like crazy breaks at this point. And the route in this game is, is mostly quite simple. You know, you do all the dungeons in order. You have to do all the dungeons, you have to collect the Triforce Shards. None of this stuff can be skipped. So, you know, I feel like it's a good game to learn. Or to get into speedrunning with. And it's really, really fun to... Um, it's not like Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask where you have to like backwalk everywhere. You're always looking ahead of yourself in this game. So, yeah, I feel like it's more fun to run. So while the intro is playing, I guess I'll just talk about what is actually going to happen here. Um, I'm playing on the English version, which is actually slower than Japanese, but, you know, as the purpose of this is to help get more people into speedrunning, I feel like it's a good idea because most people probably have the English version. And there are some root differences later on in the run between English and Japanese, so I'm just going to go with the most common one. Um, I'm also playing without the Tingle Tuner. If you've seen a speedrun of The Wind Waker, then you might know what I mean by that. Basically, the Tingle Tuner is an add-on for this game, which lets you connect your Game Boy Advance into another controller port for the GameCube. And basically, it lets you call Tingle um, at any point in the game where there's a dungeon map. And you can buy things from them, like uh, a health refill, or a magic refill, or a bomb, or something like that. And... That's really useful in this game because there's a trick where you can do like a hover off the ground but it requires you to die first and whenever you land from it Link just dies and you spawn at the start of that area. But if you call Tingle in the middle of that hover and refill your hearts then the hover will end where you do that and you can continue with the game which obviously allows you to skip quite a lot of things. Uh, but the reason I'm not using the Tingle Tuner is because the hover itself which is the Tingle Tuner's main use, requires a lot of mashing, which I feel is really uncomfortable to do, and it's not something I would recommend to someone who's learning the game for the first time. I feel like it should be, you know, more fun to play and not exhausting and not frustrating, because it can be quite stressful, because like, if you feel the hover at all, it can be quite hard to start them, because you have to mash really fast at the start. Most of all, if you fail it then that's like a massive time sink and it just completely kills your motivation. So I think the best thing to do is just avoid crazy things like that for this run and just play without a tinkle tuner. So now we're at the start of the game, well almost. There's some text here but you don't actually have to press any buttons to get through it. Um, it's only when his sister starts talking to him on the lookout that you have to press anything. So this video is going to show basically what you're supposed to do on Outset Island. Um, it's pretty simple, a lot of it's self-explanatory, but you know, it's part of a series so I feel like I should show everything. Um, our goal here is basically to get some rupees so we can buy the sail later on. And of course to get the sword. And then we can leave with the pirates. Mm -hmm. 
Alright, we're about to start now. The best way to do this is to side hop twice off the ledge, like this. Puts you the farthest distance in the water. Puts you straight on the path to Grandma's house. Now anyone who's watched the speedrun of this game in English will know that we do get the 100 rupee chest under Grandma's house. But it's faster to get that after you talk to Grandma. And you'll see why in a minute. So, we're going to run in here and talk to Grandma. Because unfortunately this cutscene can't be avoided. This is one instance where the text is like so much faster on Japanese. I definitely feel like soon or eventually the Japanese version is going to be the default for this game like it is for Ocarina of Time. Despite the gameplay differences later on. If you can hear any button mashing that's just me mashing the text. It's a shame we can't just take that shield right now and <laughs> skip coming back here later on. So what we're going to do after this cutscene's over is we're going to exit the house, we're going to crawl under the house and we're going to get the orange rupee in the chest. Which is 100 rupees and is pretty much the only money we'll need for this part of the game. Um, later on in the game we're going to need a lot of rupees to get charts deciphered from Tingle for the Triforce quest, but um, we don't need to worry about that for now. So what I did there was I kind of rolled off the ledge but I let go of the analog stick before Link got to the end and that means that he loses all of his momentum when he touches the edge and he just hangs onto it, which is the best way to clear this area. So we're just going to jump down here get this chest. And we're going to save warp after this, and this puts us back at the lookout. So you just pause, save, and then hold X, B, and start until the game resets. Uh, you can do that as soon as you press A to save. It will not corrupt your file at all, and it saves everything, so it's fine. So we're already back at the lookout. We have to climb up now and get the ladder. The ladder? The telescope. At the top of the ladder. Yeah. Here we get the best birthday present, the bir best birthday present in history. A telescope for a day, which is used exactly once in this speedrun. Now, an interesting thing you can do here is you don't actually have to adjust Link at all. Just as soon as she stops talking, just pause the game, equip the telescope, and then pull it out, and he'll automatically be looking straight at the postman, which saves a lot of frustration trying to aim at him. So you want to just hold in C up and look down at the same time. Snuck the helm rock out of the sky. Even though I'm pretty sure that rock doesn't actually hit him. <laughs> so now that Tetra's in the forest, our next goal is to get the sword so we can go up there. So we're just gonna sight hop off again, and this time we're gonna go to Orca's house, which is the one straight ahead of Link right now. Mm -hmm. 
You'll see that I'm rolling everywhere when I'm online. That's the fastest way to move in this game, which is really cool because in Ocarina of Time, like the fastest way to move is things like back walking and side hopping, which means you can't really see what you're doing and I don't know. It's kind of obnoxious sometimes. But in this game you're always looking straight ahead. So the best way to to do this is not to do little combos, but just to do single attacks over and over. Like this. It's much faster. So now we're doing the vertical slashes. And stabs. The stabs are really quick. Oops. And the spin attacks. I swear spin attacks are really hard to do in this game, like you have to rotate the stick like one and a quarter or something before it actually works. This is the parry. Um, if you actually press this on like the first frame or two that it flashes, then the second parry that you have to do is quicker. What I'm doing here is I'm doing a side top and then pressing B to jump slash. Um, it still works and it's quicker than just pressing A because he doesn't jump as high into the air. It's not really a big time saver, but it is a time saver. So since we're on English and we already have 100 rupees, we're just going to do another save up here. Skip some backtracking. So we just pause the game, press R, and then save. We press R because that automatically puts it on the save icon. If this was a Japanese version, we wouldn't actually save warp here, we'd exit the house and grab the blue rupee and the yellow rupee from the rocks on the island, on the water. Because there's no 100 rupee chest on the grandma's house, it's a heart piece on Japanese. So we're just rolling up to the forest now. Again, since this is English and tunnelless, we don't need to get any money here. But on the Japanese version, we would actually... It's gonna hit this guy so that he doesn't get in the way. On the Japanese version, we would get a red rupee from in that tree trunk that was on the ground back there. Um, you can actually get that just by doing a spin attack outside of it. And that gives us another 20 rupees. So these guys take... Five hits each to die, so I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to do three hits and then a spin attack for both of them. Because the spin attack does like two hits. Two hits worth of damage. But yeah, I messed it up pretty bad. There's not a lot you can do about it, it's just kinda enemy luck. You have to deal with whatever you get. So we're almost off this island. The game's about to start getting pretty intense. I used to really not like the graphics for this game back when it came out, because I think we were all expecting something that looked more like Ocarina of Time with Majora's Mask than this. But Nowadays I actually quite like them, I think they're a nice touch. 
certainly a lot better than Twilight Princess's graphics. Well, not really the graphics, but just the colour scheme. This game's nice and colourful, whereas Twilight Princess is like nothing but brown and green and grey. It's not very attractive. Skyward Sword is the best of both worlds in terms of graphics. But anyway, um, yeah, Link isn't really the smartest guy in the world if he thought he could make that jump. But it's fine. Because he didn't seem to get very far. Pirates, you know. Pirates. This text is really slow on English. <laughs> and like none of it is quick either, like you like none of it's quick text, you just have to wait for each text box to finish. I love the the sort of quote unquote voice acting in this game. The sounds that the characters make, it's really funny. It's something that I think should be in every Zelda game. I think my personal favourite is the the King of the Red Lions. He makes a lot of funny sounds in this game. So yeah, sorry if this is a little boring, but there's just really not a lot to say at this part of the game. It's pretty dull. It really picks up in the next section though, when we got on the pirate boat. Because then we're going to Forsaken Fortress, which is the first sort of dungeon in the game. And it's the first place where there are like actual tricks that will probably need to be practiced a bit. Whereas everything on Outset Island is just really like intuitive, anyone can figure it out. So we get to go on the ship if we go and get the shield. You know where that is. So we're actually going to pull out the sword here and just roll up to this fence. And just jump slash on top of it. Just saves going around the trees just a little bit faster. So like before, just roll up the ladder. And you just want to hold L and back and mash E here, and he'll jump off right away, which is the quickest way to get back down. It's a really um, useful feature about this game actually, you can hold L during a cutscene and it will instantly register on the first frame when the cutscene's over. Uh, in games like Ocarina of Time, you have to press L on the first... Or Z or Z or whatever on the first frame after the cutscene's over or like you can't just hold it during it, it doesn't work. So that has a few uses in this game. I tried doing a save warp here but unfortunately it puts you back at the lookout instead of at the pirates so it's pretty slow. So we just leave the house normally and jump off the sledge here and just roll over to Tetra. It's better to go behind the postman because if you're in front of him he might talk to you which wastes a ton of time because this text is really slow. So now we're on the pirate ship. And this is pretty much going to be the end of this video. Um, like I said, it's not really that interesting, but as it's part of a series, I think it's important to show everything, just to make sure we don't miss anything. The next section is going to be a lot more exciting. Uh, we're going to do the pirate minigame, and then we're going to do Forsaken Fortress, which has a really cool trick near the start of it, which skips a large portion of it and some funny strategies for dealing with the moblins. And that's going to be the next video, and after that we're going to start heading to the Mist.
The start of this game is pretty cutscene heavy, and there's just not a lot that can be done about that. You can't really skip cutscenes in this game, like you can in Ocarina of Time with glitches, or you can in Twilight Princess with the start button. So, we're just going to have to deal with it for now, but after a little while, there will be a lot more action and less cutscenes. But yeah, that's the start of it. Um, hope you guys think this is a good idea, I feel like it is. But for now, we're just going to save the game, and yeah, I'll see you in the next video, which is probably going to come tomorrow or something, or maybe later today. So, see ya.